Well, hello everyone. Uh, I see we have uh, 33 attendees so far, so let's get started. Um, welcome to the Ask the Team session for Azure Sphere. Just, uh, here we go. Here's the agenda. Um, I would like to just go over what to expect from this session today. We'll do some team intros. Uh, we have a number of experts on the call to help answer your questions today. Um, and then this is a really open-ended session. So it's pretty much going to be open questions and answers. Uh, so please feel free to start posting any questions you have about Azure Sphere uh, in, in the Q&A and, and we can start getting those uh, answered for you. So please use the chat box to ask any questions and you can either post anonymously or if you prefer, use your name. Uh, the questions get uh, 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 reviewed by uh, our experts and then, and then published so that others can see them and you can upvote your favorite questions by using the, the thumbs up. Um, and then we will have answers sometimes in the chat and sometimes uh, verbally, um, and we'll answer the most popular questions first. Uh, so please do upvote the questions you're interested in, in hearing the answer to. Uh, this session will be recorded uh, and, and please help our moderators out by not spamming the chat. Um, and as always for all Microsoft events, we adhere to the Microsoft Code of Conduct uh, which is posted here and uh, we'll get a copy of this posted into the chat so that everyone can can review that. Uh, I'm not going to read it out, uh, but please do have a read and uh, let's all follow that so we can have a, a respectful and friendly event. So let's start by meeting uh, your hosts and moderators for today. Uh, let me go ahead and share my video. So hi, uh, I'm James Scott. Uh, I'm a principal program manager on the Azure Sphere team. Uh, and my fun fact is I play water polo as a hobby. Uh, so next up is uh, Ken Woodbury. Ken, I'm going to send you live. OK, okay. Uh, just, uh, hi there, I'm uh, Ken Woodbury. I'm a um, uh, software development manager uh, on Azure Sphere. My team mostly helps customers with their Azure Sphere solutions. Uh, my fun fact was that I had lunch once with uh, Bill and Hillary Clinton. Not quite as grand as it sounds. There were lots and lots of people there. I happened to be at the college that Bill Clinton had been at many, many years ago, but uh, that's me. So in addition to myself and Ken who are, who are hosting, we have four other experts from the Azure Sphere team here. Um, uh, Nick, Steve, Laura and Chris, and I'd like to invite uh, them to introduce uh, themselves in order. So Nick, you're going live. Hey, um, I'm Nicholas Chen. I'm a senior program manager on the team. Uh, my fun fact is I live down the street from MC Hammer. Um, his mansion was, uh, the gates to his mansion were a few doors down from me. Thanks, Nick. Steve, you're up. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Patrick. Uh, I'm a PM on the Azure Sphere team. Uh, my fun fact is uh, I started working uh, on one of the first Microsoft online services. I don't know if anybody remembers, but it was called BPOS, Business Productivity Online Services, way back when. Uh, no online Azure or Azure Active Directory existed back then, so it was loads of fun. Thank you, Steve. Laura, you're up. Uh, Laura, you're on mute. Sorry. Hey, guys. Um, so uh, I'm Laura Walker. Um, I'm a senior engineer on the Azure Sphere team. Um, uh, my fun fact was that I, I once got third in a Tetris 99 uh, game, and for any of you guys that played it, it's rock hard. So I was pretty chuffed. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Chris, you're up. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Chris Whitworth. Um, I'm a uh, Senior developer on uh, senior software engineer on the uh, Azure Sphere team, um, working mostly on our samples and reference solutions. Uh, my fun fact is that I was once in a band that went on to go and have a top 40 hit some considerable time after I left. Thank you, uh, Chris. OK, so let me just um post this slide here, which is a, uh, some food for thought in terms of the questions. We have uh, some questions starting to come in, which, which our experts will start responding to and uh, publishing to the live chat so you can all see them as well. But I thought actually uh, to start with, it would be useful just to have an intro in case there are people here who don't 
know uh, what Azure Sphere is about. So we'll just spend a couple of minutes uh, introducing uh, that. Uh, Laura, you were going to uh, do a bit of an intro for us, would you? Yeah, sure. So I don't know if you. I'm pushing live, yeah. So, um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Azure Sphere, so Azure Sphere is an end-to-end -end secure IoT solution. Um, it's composed of three key components. So we've got our secure hardware, which is in the form of an Azure Sphere certified chip. We've got our secure OS that runs on top of that. Uh, and then we have our Azure Sphere uh, cloud security services. Um, and these three things allow us to uh, provide the seven properties of a highly secured device. So these seven properties are hardware root of trust, um, we've got defense in depth. We've got a small trusted computing base, small TCB, um, dynamic compartmentalization, uh, certificate based, auth based authentication and error reporting, and finally renewable security. Uh, and personally, I find that the last one, renewable security, is really interesting. So we provide OS updates for the supported lifetime of an Azure Sphere device, which is 13 years. Um, and you, as manufacturers or developers of applications that run uh, on an Azure Sphere chip, um, you can also use this update mechanism to deploy updates to your own applications without needing to roll your own update mechanism uh, from scratch. So yeah. Hopefully that gives you guys a brief overview. Yeah, Laura, thanks for that that uh, introduction. Um, so I guess one of the next questions people might have is sort of, you know, what's that good for? So we've got this very capable system there, uh, and uh, what what are uh, people able to build with it? So Nick, you're going to take that one. Uh, great. So uh, we see kind of two key application areas for Azure Sphere. Um, uh, for de delivering business value to to customers, um, one is in uh, brownfield devices, so existing installations and who for uh, existing installations of devices that may or may, that may not already be connected, but by adding Azure Sphere, you can securely connect these devices onto uh, onto the onto the internet, and then also greenfield devices, so new devices that op that open up new business opportunities. Um, those are kind of the two two uh, areas where we see kind of Azure Sphere uh, delivering a lot of value, and uh, we're seeing a lot of interest, particularly in the industrial enterprise space, where uh, uh, companies do see kind of the, the the importance of security as well as kind of the way that they can uh, either improve efficiency, uh, reduce resource con consumption, or uh, increase sustainability with Azure Sphere. Awesome, thank you, Nick. Um, so let's um, talk a little bit about what some of our, our key customers uh, are able to do with this. So Steve, could you take that one? Yeah. So uh, some of our key customers, um, there's been uh, uh, some some discussion uh, in the media and whatnot, so none of this is secret, but Starbucks is doing uh, some great things with uh, Azure Sphere. Um, you might ask, well, what is what is Starbucks? What does a coffee company need uh, with uh, moving uh, into IoT space? Uh, if you think about that, right, they have um, a lot of moving parts within a store. You think about the coffee machines themselves. You think about the recipes that are you run to actually, you know, make the drinks. Um, you think about taking temperatures for the food and things like this, and and how all of that needs to be done on a manual basis. Uh, they need to be updated. The recipes need to be updated, or somebody has to go around and actually take temperatures, or uh, they need to get data and have consistent uh, draws from the coffee uh, maker themselves. Uh, all these things are useful from a business perspective to be able to understand what your business is doing on a daily basis and how you can optimize. And so that's just one example um, of, uh, of usage for uh, Azure Sphere. Another example is, is InnoDisk. Uh, InnoDisk is out there and uh, this is this is no secret. Also, you can probably do a, just a web search on this one. Um, they're doing something really interesting, um, which is, is quite unique, I think, which is um, they've actually integrated Azure Sphere into their SSDs uh, for use in the data center. So you can actually tell performance of your drives uh, in your uh, data centers and whatnot. So there's just a few examples of, of what customers are doing today. Thank you, Steve. So uh, we have a few questions coming in. Thank you very much. Keep them flowing. Uh, we'll get those answered and, and posted for you. Um, a couple of questions so far are about cellular connected uh, services. So Nick, uh, I'd like to invite you to come in on that one. Yeah, so uh, cellular, this is uh, definitely something a lot of customers have been asking about. Uh, right now, we're taking kind of a staged approach. Initially, what we're doing is we're partnering with uh, solution providers, um, and one particular one is a company called Keo, uh, who are 
uh, who's piggybacking kind of a cellular solution, uh, connecting it to our existing Ethernet and Wi-Fi solutions, so to to enable kind of a ability for a device to get online through cellular networks. Uh, we're definitely exploring additional uh, approaches uh, that may uh, uh, produce kind of lower power or uh, uh, allow you to address additional scenarios. So please stay tuned uh, in that space. Thank you, Nick. OK, so to try and answer some of the other questions that are, are coming through, um, I see one question about um, healthcare scenarios with Azure Sphere. I think that's a very uh, interesting area. Uh, actually, we've partnered with a medical devices team uh, inside uh, Microsoft Research uh, who have built a blood pressure cuff prototype with Azure Sphere. Um, uh, um, and the, the sort of key ingredients of Azure Sphere that, that make it compelling for them are first of all, we uh, in Azure Sphere, we have the uh, high level cores uh, where you can run code that talks to the internet and talks to the network. We also have a real time cores, uh, which are completely under the control of customer applications. Uh, and so that, that's a great platform to run things under an RTOS, including, of course, Azure RTOS that we have uh, announced uh, uh, as going GA at, at this build. Um, so the, the healthcare team have used Azure RTOS uh, to, to build a blood pressure cuff where all the blood pressure reading itself happens in the real-time core. Uh, that mean, That's better for things like certification of those types of devices because all that code there is, is, is isolated and, 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 um, and completely in, in, in the developer's control. Um, and, uh, and that can be sort of di made distinct from the uh, code running on the high level core that might be the internet connected code. So yes, absolutely Azure Sphere is a, a, a great solution for healthcare. Um, and uh, you know, we, we'd love to see what people build with it. So um, Ken, I wonder, are there any other questions that are coming through that, that, uh, that we can get some answers to? Uh, yeah, there, there's been a few questions about the sort of permanent claiming of devices and the kind of balancing between the sort of security addition that that, that provides and flexibility in reusing uh, in reusing devices. Perhaps uh, one of our experts could take that question on. I'll publish one of those so people can see it. Perhaps, um, Steve, do you want to take that on, perhaps? Sure, yeah. So just to give some context to the question for those of you guys who may not be as familiar with Azure Sphere, um, this may be a bit long, longer-winded. When you are using Azure Sphere, um, we have the concept of a Azure Sphere tenant, what we call an Azure Sphere tenant. And this Azure Sphere tenant um, is authenticated, you know, from a user perspective, an administrative perspective, by a user in either Azure Active Directory or a Microsoft account. So think of like an Outlook.com or a Hotmail account or something like that, or your corporate Azure Active Directory account. So this concept of a tenant is really about managing devices. Um, so you claim what we call claim, or you associate these devices with a particular Azure Sphere tenant. And so let's imagine you have an Azure Sphere tenant called uh, Contoso North America, and you've claimed all these devices to it, and then you can manage those devices via uh, over your updates of your application and things like this. So that's kind of the, 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 the baseline concept. Uh, the questions I think revolve around the fact is today that you can claim a device, a physical hardware device uh, to a particular tenant, but you cannot move that device between tenants. And so I see in, in one of the questions, like I think it might be a instructor or um, uh, some kind of a classroom environment where he's had some devices claimed to tenants um, and then he'd like to move them. The students have moved on and he wants to move them into uh, his 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 tenant. Um, unfortunately, today that's not possible. So. Uh, there, we are definitely looking at, uh, there's many scenarios where this would be useful, not just uh, a development scenario or um, an, uh, an educational scenario. Um, however, there are some tricky things we need to think about when we do that. Uh, we need to think about like who can unclaim when you unclaim a device, how do you securely transfer that device? How do you move ownership? Uh, and this is, a, this is not um, something new to the industry. There's a lot of other uh, companies working on this and how to securely do transfer of ownership and whatnot. Uh, we definitely want to be addressing this in the future, but for today, um, once you claim a device to a tenant, it is glued to that device. Thank you, Spat. And I see there's another set of questions which uh, I wonder if you you could take on as well around uh, 
Azure IoT Edge and, and Azure Sphere. Can you talk about the relationship between those products? Yeah, so I, I saw that one as well. I think um, a, a clarifying question I would have would be, I think what they mean is um, Azure Sphere is what's called a downstream device. Uh, and that would be um, the device that is sending telemetry or communicating and sending data to the Azure uh, IoT Edge device versus and IRT, Azure IoT Edge device that is actually running Azure Sphere. And so that's how I'll answer the question here. Um, today, you can actually use Azure Sphere and you can connect and you can send telemetry to uh, an Azure IoT Edge device. Um, um, the documentation might leave something to be desired and we'll definitely be working towards better samples and better uh, um, documentation on how you integrate this. But um, as a downstream device, you can authenticate to uh, an Azure IoT Edge device via the uh, certificate-based authentication mechanisms that IoT Edge supports today. So if you're familiar with Azure IoT Edge, uh, you can have uh, a downstream device essentially load a trust bundle. You can load a trust bundle of the certificates that you trust onto the IoT Edge device. And so in this particular case, you would load the trust bundle or the trusted certificate authority from the Azure Sphere tenant onto the IoT Edge device, and then you can authenticate to the IoT Edge device. Um, if you're familiar with IoT Edge, you would also need to deal with the parenting and linking of, of child, child devices and things like that. But um, that 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 is possible today, um, and we'll be posting uh, more documentation in the near future as far as uh, how to do that. Great, thank you, Steve. Um, we've also had a, a similar question on the integration of Azure Sphere and IoT Central. And perhaps, uh, Chris, you could take that one. Yeah, sure. OK. Um, so for those who aren't familiar with IoT Central, it's a uh, sort of turnkey software as a service um, uh, bundling of several uh, Azure IoT services into a sort of friendly interface. Um, so you can uh, you don't have to worry about provisioning your own IoT hubs. You don't have to worry about um, creating um, uh, a device provisioning service and things like that. And it streamlines gathering of um, telemetry um, from devices. Um, you can uh, create views um, of, that, of that telemetry considerably more simply. Um, you don't have to plumb events into um, Power BI or things like that. It, it, it takes care of everything for you. And so obviously it's a sort of a massively useful uh, tool for uh, getting up and running with um, Azure IoT in general. Um, and so as part of IoT Central's GA, uh, which I believe they announced today, um, we have uh, been working with them to make sure that there's a, a sort of an out of the box uh, solution there for Azure Sphere as well. So we um, th there's two parts to this. Um, I believe uh, IoT Central have already published that part, which is that now when creating a new app within IoT Central, uh, there's a template for an Azure Sphere device uh, containing some default functionality. Um, and we have updated our uh, Azure IoT sample, uh, which is on GitHub, uh, will be published on GitHub later today uh, to work with that template. Um, so that will enable people to have a, a starting point when building um, applications for IoT Central using Azure Sphere devices. Um, there was another question about Azure PNP, and I think James can probably speak to that a little bit more better than I can. Sure. Um, yes, uh, uh, happy to speak to that. Uh, Azure uh, IoT PNP uh, at the moment is uh, in preview, and it relies on some um, uh, APIs on the device, uh, which uh, whenever we support an API on, a, on an Azure Sphere device, uh, that is a long-term support. The, the reason that we can provide OS updates for that 13-year uh, you know, period uh, while your application continues to operate uh, regardless, right? And you can just stay asleep when those CVEs hit and the Microsoft team can take care of that. Uh, it, what's crucially important for that is a stable ABI surface uh, so that your, your application must only rely on a binary interface that we continue to support. Um, and so for that reason, we need to be careful about uh, only putting in uh, APIs into that surface that are long term supported. Um, and, and as such, uh, PNP support uh, is certainly on our roadmap. Of course, we need to enable people to take advantage of PNP and Azure Sphere. Uh, but uh, there's a, a, a time uh, issue there where uh, until that hits uh, GA, 
then uh, we, we can't offer formal support for it in Azure Sphere. Uh, let me also handle another uh, few questions about Azure RTOS that are coming in. Uh, there's a lot of excitement about using Azure RTOS and the fact that this is now announced um, uh, you know, uh, for use with, with Azure Sphere. Um, but what is important to know, uh, there was a, couple, a question about free RTOS, um, which is supported by MediaTek's uh, uh, BSP on Azure Sphere uh, that they publish. Uh, and there's uh, other questions about, are we going to restrict it so you can only use Azure RTOS on these uh, real-time cores? Um, none of it, it is not the case in any way that we're going to restrict the code that you can run on the real-time cores. Uh, those cores are for your use, the customer's use, um, from the register level up. Um, the whole point of that system is if you have existing code uh, or applications or, or any other tool chain you want to use, as long as you can uh, generate code that targets um, that class of processor, then what the Azure Sphere system will do is to um, package it up, sign it as coming from Microsoft when it's over the air deployed, and uh, deploy it to the device, load it onto that core and start it for you. Uh, with Azure RTOS uh, integration, we obviously uh, are offering an, uh, uh, a nice getting started experience and, and an RTOS there has a lot of great features that we believe in strongly uh, um, for implementing safe uh, code execution, um, but there's no restriction that you must use that. So I hope that that clarifies that one. Can, um, I, just, can I just jump in briefly, James, because there's another Azure RTOS related question that's sort of the other way around saying, do you always have to use Azure RTOS in relation with Azure Sphere? And the answer to that is no, you can use Azure RTOS in, in other systems as well. So I just wanted to add that bit of clarification. Absolutely, and, thanks. Um, uh, while, I'm, while I'm here too, I, we, we've had a number of questions, a big upvote on question about other language support beyond C. And um, I'll turn that. Um, I'll turn over to uh, Laura to uh, to answer that one. Thanks. Here you go, Laura. So, um, so obviously at the moment um, we support C. And, and to sort of refer back to James's uh, answer to a previous question, um, uh, it's a sort of a deliberate decision to enable us to have this long-term constrained set of libraries um, and headers that we support. Um, we uh, have obviously thought about other languages, um, and you know. Um, uh, C++ is the most obvious one, and it's certainly something that we're considering. Um, I don't think we can sort of say that we have kind of a concrete plan there. Um, and, and uh, you know, C Sharp and Rust, uh, well, never say never. You know, I'd love to see them. But uh, but obviously the, the constraint here is that, you know, we, we do offer this long term support for for these for these headers and these libraries um, and and we need to be really confident that we can continue to support that and, and that we're not we're not breaking our security model at all by by releasing support for other languages. Can I just jump in on that yep. one very quickly as well? Um, obviously, when we're talking about um, use of those languages, um, use of C versus C++, Rust and C Sharp, um, we're talking specifically about the high level cores that are present on Azure Sphere chips uh, running um, on the same core as the Azure Sphere OS. If there are other cores present on um, chips, so the MT3620 has two real time cores, um, obviously you can, if you, if you have the tool chain available to you, you can um, code in whichever language you choose for those. Um, obviously that's outside of um, our uh, sort of Azure Sphere OS and, and, and the tool chain there, but uh, if you are willing to sort of roll your own um, onto the bare metal there, then uh, other languages are available. Thanks, Chris. Um, I see we've had a couple of people inquire about uh, Microsoft certification for sort of Azure Sphere professionals, much as we have our Azure IoT certification. Um, does anyone on the panel want to take that? If, if not, I can take that. Because I think the short answer is um, it's not available yet, but there are we are certainly talking about plans for such for such training and certification. So uh, it's a short answer, but that's um, um, uh, that's that's where we are. You can you can certainly expect it at some point. Yeah, and just to chip in on that, um, I think uh, we'd be very interested in hearing from you. Uh, more directly, uh, there's a limit to how much we feedback we can get in the Q&A session, but uh, we'll share some links at the end of this uh, for you to reach out to us. Sorry, excuse the plane in the background. We're all working from home. Um, uh, we're very interested in hearing what we could provide that would best support your business and your and your developers. 
Um, I wonder if we could uh, uh, flip over to actually just doing a quick demo because demos are fun. Um, and this being built uh, and about the developer experience, um, it would be great to uh, be able to uh, uh, show just quickly in case any of you haven't seen it, the, the Azure Sphere developer experience we have. And uh, Chris, I believe you've got something that are lined up for me. If I put you on the spot too quick, then let me know. We can always come back to you at another moment if, if it's not working, but let me know. Uh, Chris? Um, can you see my uh, uh, Visual Studio yeah. there, James? I'm just sending you live and I'm going to send your desktop live in a second after that. There we go. I think everyone okay. should be able to see that now. Thank you. Um, am I live in the picture as well? Because I have a dev board and uh, things to show. You, uh, you are momentarily. OK. Um, so anyway, this is our, um, so yes, the Visual Studio developer experience for um, uh, for Azure Sphere. Hopefully the most remarkable thing about this is that it's unremarkable. You get the standard Visual Studio developer experience. Um, so the thing to note is that all Azure Sphere projects are CMake based as opposed to VCX proj. Um, so have a simple CMake lists um, which describes the application. Um, and as we've said before, we code in C. Um, and yeah, um, so this is our Hello World app. You can clone it from our GitHub repository. All it does is it's a sort of a proof of tool chain. So it um, compiles, deploy, when you compile it and deploy it to uh, a dev board like this, um, it blinks an LED, or turns it on and off. Um, and so if I go ahead and do that by hitting uh, start debugger, let me disable that breakpoint to start. So it's compiled it. It's now deploying the applications of this device. Um, it's worth noting that um, <clears throat> Azure Sphere devices, by default, you can't just deploy straight to. This is um, a development board that has been put into developer mode. Um, a normal, you know, deployed device in the field will not. You know, you, you can't just walk up to it and deploy arbitrary code to it. This is a specific um, mode that um, is available for dev boards. So, right. Um, so this is deployed to the device now. Um, as you can see, we've run and we've hit the first breakpoint. Um, again, exactly like you would expect in Visual Studio, you can we can inspect um, variables, the current state of the uh, program. And if I disable the breakpoint, and continue. Um, we can see, hopefully, uh, that the LED there is blinking on and off uh, once a second. Um, if I re enable the breakpoint, we'll hit it, and then we can use the usual um, Visual Studio debugger functionality to modify program state as it's running. So, change the sleep time. So blinking the LED from one second to two seconds, disable the breakpoint and continue. And hopefully we can see that the LED is now blinking at the rate of once every two seconds. And so, yeah, you get your normal um, Visual Studio developer experience um, uh, complete with uh, debugging. Um, it's worth noting that in our latest release of the SDK um, and the extension of uh, the 2004 release, we now have the ability to simultaneously debug both the high level core um, and the real time cores. This was something that uh, previously you couldn't do, um, and it's a really nice feature uh, if you're deploying um, uh, applications to the high level core and the real time core simultaneously. Um, and so I recommend if you if you haven't had a chance to look at that, that you that you do so. Right, um, I think that's. Thank you so much, uh, Chris. I hope that was uh, useful, everyone. Uh, just changing this back now to to uh, uh, send myself live again. Um, we've had a, another couple of questions all around the theme of, of the silicon, both in terms of the the cost uh, and power consumption of, of the MT3620 and also about future silicon. So I'd like to invite Nick Chen to, to come in on that, please. 
Uh, thanks, James. Uh, so the first thing let's address is the cost of the chip. I don't have the specific pricing uh, available for the chip, but it's a touch under $10 for the chip. But remember, this also this includes the chip itself, but also the 13 years of service OS updates and um, application updates. So uh, that needs to be factored in. Uh, in terms of, uh, I think the same the, the same question. Uh, also asked about how much power does the chip consume? Obviously, the power will depend on your use case. Um, I, I believe the, uh, the with Wi-Fi on, we run at about 100 milliamps, but this is something you should, I definitely encourage you to look at um, the data sheet from MediaTek uh, because that will be the, 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 the final truth about, about that topic. James, is there something else that uh, follow up or? Yes. Um, could you say a bit more about the the upcoming silicon? I know that we've had announcements, uh, obviously from NXP and Qualcomm about about upcoming Azure Sphere chips. So, what can we share? Well, so I mean, I think uh, obviously people know about the NXP and Qualcomm parts um, uh, based on their press releases. Even though we work closely with our silicon partners, we have a very strong team position that uh, this information is our partners to share. Uh, and so when they're ready to kind of provide more information, that's um, where you'll hear it first from. Um, so, but I really encourage you to work with, if you already have a relationship with these silicon, uh, with our silicon, with these particular companies or with other um, other silicon partners, um, I, I highly encourage you to talk to them about Azure Sphere uh, and they may be able to provide you kind of more advanced details. Thank you, Nick. Uh, I'd also like to pick up on another a couple of questions that I'm seeing around, can you use Azure Sphere uh, OS on different devices like a Raspberry Pi, or can we just you know, expand Azure Sphere to supporting other chips? Um, and I'd like to do this by actually sharing, oops, let's get that going, uh, the seven properties of uh, highly secured devices uh, um, slide let me just send that live so everyone can see that and so the the, the short answer to uh you know can i just use the azure sphere os or you know just put that on like something like a raspberry pi the short answer is no and the reason being that um you know what what we're doing with azure sphere is provide a platform where we we believe and we vouch for uh the fact that it is secured end to end and so what we've done is we've looked at, uh, as Laura introduced in, in the introduction, we've, we've gone away and looked at what it takes for a platform to have that uh, security, that end-to-end -end security, that means it can resist attacks over the long term. Uh, and we've based uh, that on our, our long experience at Microsoft on, on producing uh, OSs and, and devices that, that uh, are internet exposed, uh, and we've boiled that down to these seven properties. So what we do is encourage you to go and look at for each of your devices, anytime you're trying to think about doing an IoT device deployment, uh, this should be your bar. Does your system meet this? Um, and then the thing to notice about that is that um, the, you know, it is not uh, trivial to meet all of these things. Some of these things, for example, the renewal security that, that Laura mentioned in particular, that relies on support in the device, but also a cloud service supporting it as well. Um, uh, for uh, hardware root of trust, um, that could just be in the hardware, but but for, uh, uh, for example, for certificate-based authentication, what we do there is that the de our device, when it boots, it uses hardware support in the silicon for attesting that the, uh, operating, the operating system that we trust is booted that that attestation then goes up to our security service and then our security service issues a certificate to that device so that when it connects with your services it can prove it really belongs to you and it can prove that it uh, uh, is running uh, bits that microsoft trusts because otherwise it would not get that certificate and it can prove it really is that device and not another of your devices pretending to be that device um, so in order to provide that 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 end-to-end -end, uh, that's why we've said no. We, we know we th this platform comprises uh, uh, special silicon meeting our our requirements, uh, an, an OS which which performs all of these functions, and a cloud service working together in concert. So it's not possible just to take one of these elements uh, and and just use it with a, a, another another piece of silicon that, for example, doesn't include the hardware root of trust. Um, 
that's the way that Microsoft can provide this uh, um, this this security uh, uh, service for this device over the lifetime and take that worry away from you. So uh, with that said, uh, Ken, do we have any other questions coming in that we could uh, get answered? Um, yeah, there are lots more coming in. I just wanted to, though, before that, um, follow up a little bit what Nick said about the future silicon, because we've had a couple of people ask specifically if we have any plans for a cheaper chip that maybe only has the A7. And, you know, I can't announce anything exactly like that, but James, could you put up the slide that has all of our silicon partners on it? Just so I can talk to this, because we're, yeah, you know, as, as Nick mentioned, we're working with a large number of silicon partners. NXP and Qualcomm are the two that, that have announced that they're going to be building Azure Sphere chips. But our specification as to what constitutes a, um, you know, a, um, a certified Azure Sphere chip doesn't specify the number of real-time cores that there has to be, for instance. So there are two on the 3620, but there could be anything from zero up to however many uh, the particular partner wants to put on the chip. Um, so although we can't, you know, I can't say sp specifically, yes, we're going to be building that kind of ship. If you look at the number of silicon partners that we're talking to, the first two that have announced, there will certainly be a large, a large variety of chips on the market in the in the longer run to cover a you know a number of different um, uh, use cases. So I just wanted to um, to add that little bit of clarification. Um, so uh, thank you, Ken. I, I would just also just add one tiny clarification there. Of course, in addition to NXP and Qualcomm, we have a chip in market that's the MediaTek MT3620, which is an Azure Sphere certified chip that is uh, uh, ready for use right now. So uh, please go and use that chip as well. Um, so uh, we've had a, uh, some questions okay. about uh, using cloud services other than uh, Azure. And Chris, I think you're able to come in on that one. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, the simple answer is that um, so far as applications running on an Azure Sphere device are concerned, you can use them with whichever cloud service you like. Um, the SDK that we ship um, for Azure Sphere devices contains um, uh, the Azure IoT SDK, so you can talk to um, Azure the Azure IoT services out of the box. Um, but um, we also provide curl um, the HTTPS library in the SDK as well. So if the cloud service that you're wanting to talk to um, from, you know, be, be that a, a, another cloud service or your own HTTPS endpoints, um, you can quite happily do that as well. Um, it is worth saying, obviously, that the security services and device updates are all uh, based in the Azure cloud, um, but um, you know, hopefully you as an application developer don't have a, ever have to worry about that and that doesn't affect you um, if you want to run your telemetry in your um, back end services on another cloud service, then you are um, completely able to do so. Obviously, we would prefer and encourage you to use Azure IoT. Um, the uh, sort of integration between the services um, we think is is particularly good, especially with the launch of um, or the, the GA of IoT Central today. Um, but yeah, you, you can talk HTTPS to um, uh, other services without a problem. Thank you, Chris. So we've had a few questions about uh, certificate uh, authentication. So Spat, could you could you clarify uh, the answer to those questions, please? Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, so I'm looking at the, the couple of quite different questions here. Um, and I'll try to address both of them. Um, some of them are around how the, how the certificates are provisioned to the system and some questions about the security man in the middle. Then there's some other questions about uh, signing and encryption. So let me talk to both those. Um, first of all, so uh, James talked a bit about uh, how Pluton is used in uh, uh, doing remote attestation. And, and to be clear on remote attestation, right? So when a device boots up, um, there is secure boot uh, if you're familiar with that. So you know, goes through the secure boot process and verifies that the binaries are signed properly and, and genuine. Um, but in addition, when we do remote attestation, we determine if the operating system is trusted, right? So genuine versus trusted are two different things here. Um, and being a trusted operating system, you could say, well, you know, version one, for example, was was genuine, and then now we're in version ten, and somewhere in between there was some security issues, and version seven, let's say, is no longer trusted, right? And so that's why we have this uh, daily. Uh, 
regular, as long as you're online, rural attestation process. Um, the certificate uh, key that's generated um, is kept on the device uh, and Pluton uh, protects that uh, private key. Um, and then from a signing perspective, uh, it's much like any other signing process. We don't send exactly a CSR up to the DA service, uh, but we do send something very similar uh, with the nonce and some other information around it to help protect it from replay attacks and whatnot. And then the short-lived device, which is around 24 hours, uh, is uh, used for client authentication. And that is sent back down to the device where you can use it to connect to DPS, IoT Hub, uh, or as uh, Chris just mentioned, uh, third-party clouds using uh, libcurl and HTTPS uh, for mutual authentication. Um, so I hope that answers some of those questions. As far as a man in the middle attack goes, uh, you know, we do trust the TLS channel uh, to secure that that uh, encryption channel. But if somebody were to obtain the um, the public certificate, the, the, you really couldn't do anything unless you could actually, uh, uh, as I mentioned, the private key is protected by Pluton um, in the system. So um, you can't uh, uh, impersonate a device at that point. Um, as far as the other question, the roadmap, um, uh, are there any plans to let developers leverage Pluton to do data signing and encryption within programs running on Sphere? This is a great question. I hear this actually quite a bit. Um, and yes, we are looking at in the future um, some way to allow customers to be able to perhaps um, generate keys, do encryption, uh, signing operations and, and things of that nature. Um, it's not available yet. Um, but we'd love to hear more feedback, and I think um, at some point there'll be a feedback link posted uh, where if you do have more requirements on that, I would love to hear uh, from you uh, about more details on your scenarios. But yes, that's certainly something we're, we're looking at. Okay, thank you very much, Pat, for all those details. Um, let me uh, pull the video back. Um, so I saw... Uh, a couple of questions which I can help comment on. I mean, uh, one is, are we looking at platform I.O. Uh, in VS Code? Uh, the short answer is yes, we are. Um, that I know the the uh, the dev, dev team is looking at, at, at that integration. Um, I don't have anything to announce about it, a timeline or something, but we're, we're definitely looking at that. Um, uh, there's another uh, question about, uh, do we recommend using Azure Sphere for smart bulbs and would we install that in the bulb? or use a Wi-Fi enabled chip in the bulb? Uh, well, one of the value uh, uh, propositions of Azure Sphere is that uh, uh, it is secured against in being internet facing by Microsoft. So um, the, the our advice on that would be whatever you have in that smart bulb or in any other IoT application that is, uh, that is internet facing, should meet the seven properties of highly secure devices and Azure Sphere provides uh, a, an easy way to do that where Microsoft does the heavy lifting. Um, so the direct answer to your question is, well, is the Wi-Fi enabled chip in your smart bulb, is, the, is, is there an existing chip which you're looking at, does it meet the seven properties of highly secure devices? If so, great. Um, uh, and if you look at the total cost to you of implementing uh, uh, the you know and 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 making sure to 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 follow those some properties then uh, you know that includes uh, an OS team that will will update uh, the OS when when vulnerabilities in that OS arise um, so you know that's where we think Azure Sphere makes a very compelling uh, offering because uh, it all comes packaged uh, up and and Microsoft's uh, taking care of that so. Uh, that handles that question. Ken, are there any more questions that we can uh, we can answer? Uh, yes, somebody's asking about the um, the new emerging IoT um, specific wireless networks like LoRa and things like that, and whether um, we have any plans to support that. And I wonder if I could turn that over to uh, I don't know one of the, whoever Nick. in the panel wants to take. <laughs> uh, Nick, can I bring you in? Sorry, can you repeat the question, Ken? Um, do we have any 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 plans to support um, wireless networks like LoRa that are being that are coming more and more on speed for IoT? Uh, I think uh, I mean there's there's not going to I don't think we have any plans to support kind of uh, these types of low power networks natively like as part of the core OS. I think customers have the ability to uh, pair a LoRa radio, for example, uh, with their Azure Sphere chip um, and uh, the Azure Sphere side would 
take care of securing the device um, on the internet connected side. Um, we will be planning to release some additional guidance about how customers and partners could um, implement systems like this kind of in the most secure way possible. And that's definitely something we're planning to do. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, all right. Ken, do you know if there are any other questions that, that, that need answering? Uh, yeah. if, uh, I've, I've got one. Oh, I think okay. we can. Go on. No, I was just going to say that a, a couple of people are, are asking about uh, clouds other than Azure, um, whether, you know, because we do mention in some of our documentation that we do support them. Does somebody want to take that? Uh, I actually think that uh, Chris did handle that that one earlier. We, we talked oh, about it. Okay. Yeah, we talked about the fact that um, we uh, absolutely Azure Sphere OS makes it possible to um, securely communicate with any external service. Uh, including Azure IT, but also including any other service that, that you want to talk to. Um, I, I've got one I'd love to bring up and, and, and get more detail out there about. So enterprise Wi-Fi is something that I know we hear a lot from customers is very important to them. Um, uh, you know, uh, when when connecting up Internet of Things devices in enterprise situations, uh, you know, the pre-shared key is not uh, that is used in, in homes is not appropriate and I, I was very excited to see that our 24 release of Azure Sphere supported uh, EPGLS and I, I would like to invite uh, Steve to give some bit more detail about that. Great, yeah. Uh, thanks James. So uh, as he mentioned in our most recent release uh, we support uh, access to and connecting to secure enterprise Wi-Fi networks which is great. Uh, for those of you guys who aren't familiar with that, um, think of your, you know, your home network. Um, you, you have a password, a password connected to your home network. Um, and as James mentioned, from a from a network security perspective, uh, from a business perspective, industrial or or enterprise uh, class networks, that's probably not appropriate. Um, you know, if your password were taken and, and posted on a public channel, then everybody could connect to your network, right? And so you definitely don't want that happening. And so um, the technology there is sometimes referred to as W. WPA2 Enterprise, sometimes it's referred to as just Secure Enterprise Access uh, or EPTLS. And really what this is, is you can essentially um, take a device today, an Azure Sphere device, and you can um, uh, load uh, a certificate on there to connect to your network, and it can connect to your Secure Enterprise uh, network, which is, which is great, right? There's a lot of customers out there who have this need um, to be able to connect to their corporate network in a secure manner. And so I think this is really a, a, a uh, a great step uh, for IoT in general and just being able to connect to secure networks. Um, I'd love to see that in other devices as well. Um, so yeah, uh, super excited to to release that and uh, hope to hear feedback from you guys in the near future as you guys start using this. Thank you, thank you Steve. Um, we Thanks. did have one question which I can help clarify uh, as well. Uh, so there's a question about uh, Azure RTOS, which we talked about earlier. And at the moment, as of today, there isn't a sample online showing you easily how to integrate between Azure Sphere and Azure RTOS. Um, that's true. Uh, there's no sample online currently. I'd ask you to bear with us. Uh, we're uh, working very hard on it and it will be there um, uh, very shortly. So uh, that, that will be there. We will provide hopefully uh, the, the usual, I hope, high level of, of support uh, for, for making it easy for you to get started with those things. Um, uh, with Azure Sphere and Azure Artos working together. So, do we have any more um, questions? That, that yeah, we've we... had a we've had a question about update. Somebody asking about how the um, the application developer controls update and whether it will be easy or not. And so, I, perhaps I could ask um, um, uh, Chris to answer that one. Sure. Um, so, I mean, the, the the first thing to say basically is that. Um, Updates for Azure Sphere devices, for the most part, should be completely transparent. Um, the OS itself handles um, communication with our security services, um, which will provision updates as they become available. Um, so in the simplest case, um, if you're happy for the OS to handle everything for you, uh, your application and uh, operating system will be silently and automatically updated for you. Um, 
if that doesn't work because, say, your device is running some critical piece of infrastructure and um, you know the risk of an OS update tearing it down and rebooting might cause um, problems in your particular environment, um, you know, a washing machine stops running or your piece of industrial equipment uh, stops working because um, the attached device uh, has decided to reboot. Um, we provide uh, APIs um, in the uh, in the SDK that allow you to uh, register for notifications for updates. Um, so you'll find out when an update is ready for your device um, and you can also defer those updates for a period of time um, so that you can complete any uh, critical operations um, and then re-enable and, uh, and, and permit the update at a later time. So we give you some control uh, over that, um, but ultimately, yes, the, the um, updates will be uh, automatically provisioned by our security services. So, um, yeah. Um, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, OK, so there was a question about C and the fact that there are well-known exploits in C. Uh, Laura, I believe you're going to answer that one. Yeah, so um, I think I think the, the relevant things to point out here um, so our, like I mentioned earlier uh, about one of the seven properties being that we have um, dynamic compartment, we have compartmentalized uh, bits in our OS um, and the application runs in its own sandbox. So um, uh, we've kind of very carefully kind of structured our OS so that even in the event that if, if an app were to be compromised, uh, firstly, it's it's restricted to what it can access. It's very restricted to what it can do. Um, apps always have um, an application manifest that determine the what the capabilities they can access, whether they can access particular uh, GPIOs or I2C or, or, or bits on the bits of hardware. Um, they have a firewall. Um, so when you uh, compile your app, you specify the endpoints it can hit. Um, and and there are ways of allowing, you know, if you need sort of specific dynamic endpoints, we, we can support that as well. But um, that means that there's kind of a very um, restricted set of things that even a compromised app could do anyway. Um, so whilst C, yes, there are there are known uh, potentially uh, C is quite a difficult language to use potentially. Um, uh, hopefully in the event that an app were to be compromised, there's very little it would be able to do on its own. Um, so uh, I don't know whether that quite answers the question, but but uh, yeah. Thank you, Laura. Um, all right, uh, let me, let me, uh, Nick, I, I think I've, there's I've, a question. I've actually got a question. Oh, go on. Uh, that some, somebody's asking what, whether or not we have um, any support for a sort of deep sleep mode. And I think uh, I think Nick is um, is prepared to answer that as part of our whole um, power uh, conversation. Yes, thanks, Ken. Uh, I'm not too familiar with uh, the specific kind of deep sleep and what functionality uh, uh, this questioner is asking for. So uh, this is going to be more of a generic answer. Uh, one of the recent features we launched is a uh, low power power down mode. And what this uh, puts what this allows the chip to do is to basically put itself into kind of a, it turns the chip off. Uh, with the ability to wake itself up kind of based on an external signal or based on a set time. And so once it's in this power down mode, uh, the chip itself is uh, consuming extremely uh, low amounts of power kind of in the order of uh, several microamps. Um, whether that kind of uh, the, the resumption time uh, works for your scenario, I think uh, we'll have to dig deeper into that. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, were there any other uh, questions coming in that, that we could pick up on? There's um, there's a question about differential updates, but I don't know whether we already covered that as part of our when um, uh, Chris was talking about update. Uh, I think uh, I'd like some more clarity around that. I mean, with updates, the way it works is that uh, Microsoft providing the operating system updates and uh, also uh, the, the application updates uh, from, uh, fr fr for your applications are sent via the Azure Sphere Security Service. Um, so in both those cases, uh, Microsoft is uh, sending down the updates to the device. 
uh, and, and sort of we're responsible for that protocol and for making sure the updates uh, arrive safely and are signed and, and, and so on. Um, uh, at the moment, that protocol, we, we do have uh, uh, a number of um, uh, elements of that protocol designed to reduce its bandwidth by only sending down what we need to send down, of course. Um, but uh, I'd like to understand a bit more about any question about uh, differential updates. Is there a, is there a need there for uh, you know even further uh, reduced bandwidth for updates? Uh, I'd like to understand the scenario a bit better. Um, was there any other question that we could go to? Right. Um, OK, well, uh, please do keep the questions coming and, and we can answer them. Um, uh, I do see another uh, question about can you use an external uh, um, TPM with Azure Sphere? Well, uh, the answer to that one is that the uh, Azure Sphere certified chips already have the, uh, um, the, the hardware root of trust designed by Microsoft integrated into the silicon. So there's no need to use an external TPM uh, alongside uh, alongside Azure Sphere. Um, okay. There's, um, there, there is a question about whether we have any sample source code for integrating with other embedded OSs. Now, I think we probably touched on that a little bit with the talking about the real time cores, but I don't know whether Anybody wants to address that in any more detail? I mean, I can I can speak to it in, in very general terms. Um, in that, um, the on our samples repository, we have one existing sample that shows communication between the high level core and the real time core on the MT3620. Currently, that's implemented um, against bare metal on the uh, real time core of the MT3620, um, but you could adapt that for use with another um, RTOS running on that real-time core. Um, this feature is in beta at the moment. Um, it should hopefully be hitting long-term support soon, um, but uh, say just keep in mind that that sample is, is currently um, using beta functionality. So I don't know if that's the sort of thing that you're talking about there. Um, if this is for communication with uh, another MCU running um, an RTOS off device, um, then uh, we don't currently provide a sample for that, but we are aware that um, you know many people have requested uh, some sample code or some reference solution based around that, uh, and that's something that we are looking at, that we're thinking about. Obviously, you can roll your own using um, the UARTs on the MT3620 and any other MCU that you have, um, but uh, as I say, um, it's something that we're we're aware of them um, that several people you know uh, have asked for and uh, and that we're, we are thinking about so okay thank thank you very much i think uh we've uh, uh done our best here to go through um all of your uh questions um and if you have any further questions we are very happy to answer them uh we posted an email address that you can reach out to that our, our Build 2020 team is, is monitoring uh, in the chat. Uh, we'd also encourage you to check out all the other Azure Sphere related content uh, uh, in, uh, in, in Build this year, uh, and particularly also the IoT show hosted by Olivier Bloch. Um, there's a number of different Azure Sphere um, uh, related uh, uh, shows uh, that are live on that, including one that went live today that shows Azure Sphere being used uh, with Azure RTOS in a balancing robot. That, that's really proving that we can uh, hit uh, real-time control needs in, um, uh, in, in Azure Sphere chips using those real-time cores. Um, but with that, I think we'll call time on this session. Uh, please do, as I said, if you've got any further questions, uh, let's take them offline. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for this session and enjoy the rest of build. Thank you.